Today, our speaker is uh, Dr. Matteo Vibinatori from uh, NREO. Uh, he's going to talk about industrial vehicles, uh, grid integration. This should be an interesting talk. I want to remind everyone uh, the next presentation is in two weeks. So someone from the industry will talk about cybersecurity in the electric grid. And, uh, there is, there's a chair here. And uh, we, we might permanently move to this room. So I'll let everyone know. So, so it's, it's between this room and that room. So I'll let everyone know. So this is for those uh, who, who are joining us remotely. Uh, use the Q&A feature if you have any in-depth questions for a speaker. So all these questions will be answered at the end of, of the uh, presentation. So a quick introduction of our speaker. Uh, Matteo is a distinguished researcher at NREO. And he, he, he leads and manages the Transportation Energy Transition Analysis Group to explore system level sustainable solutions for the transformation of the trans transportation sector. So uh, he got his bachelor and master degree from the Polytechnic University uh, in Milan. And, and his PhD in mechanical engineering with a minor in statistics from Ohio State University. So uh, without further delay, I'll let you start uh, your presentation. Most of you have already heard about national labs, uh, but perhaps not everyone knows there are 17 uh, national labs as part of the Department of Energy Complex. We are located in Golden, Colorado, right outside of Denver. We have about 3,000 people, and we have one big mission, energy efficiency and renewable energy. That's what we, we've been doing for, for almost 50 years now, and so that's, uh, that's a, an area that we really focus on. Um, as I said, I'm going to start at a pretty high level. That's the U.S. energy use over the past couple of centuries. And energy use has increased very significantly and is very closely tied to our lifestyle. You know, think about everything that you do in your life. How you move around, how you communicate, the buildings that you live in, the comfort, the refrigerators, the cooking, the objects that we, that we use every day in our everyday life is all tied to energy. Right? So incredible growth in our lifestyle and in our energy use. And so far, most of that has come from fossil fuels. It's about 80% in the US today. That has been great, right? Our lifestyle has increased significantly over the last couple of centuries, but you know, nothing comes for free. And the major price of fossil fuels are some of the geopolitical implications that I'm not gonna touch on today, and a lot of the environmental implications. So I just wanna go through a couple of examples, you know, air pollution kills an estimated 7 million people every single year. And that's largely due to the uh, combustion of fossil fuels. You've seen pictures like this, water and land being contaminated. And many people talk about climate change as our uh, generation's biggest challenge. I, I have a couple of quotes here from the IPCC, a very long report, but if you're interested in this topic, I, I suggest you take a look. Uh, but recent Changes in the climate are widespread, they're rapid, they're intensifying, and they are unprecedented in thousands of years. You might hear otherwise in the media, the scientific community is now fully behind the fact that it is indisputable that it's human activities that are causing this, right? And it's not just a, a long-term effect. Extreme events are becoming more aggressive and more frequent. So overall, we don't think there is any going back. You know, we, we have done uh, significant damage to, to the planet that we live in already, but we can slow down some of these changes. We can stop some of those changes. And what's gonna be needed to do that is very strong, very rapid and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, right? It, it, it is now imperative and it is now very urgent. I can't stress it enough. When you think about energy systems, you talk about 2050, like it was very far into the future. Well, keep in mind, a lot of our energy systems last for several decades. So it's not even one turnaround of the system between now and 2050, right? The, the, the time that we have available to solve this problem isn't a lot. And so we do a lot of work and a lot of research to try and inform what does that transformation look like? How do we go from where we are today to a system that is sustainable uh, by, by 2050, which is when we think we might have a chance of getting uh, to a system that hasn't completely destroyed our, our planet. Um, so I'll go back here a little bit now in, in more details about our energy system. I told you about 80% of the energy that we use today 
comes from petroleum. You see that in the pie chart. Petroleum, natural gas, coal, so sorry, not petroleum, fossil energy. Fossil energy is about 80% of our energy use. The other 20% is roughly split in half between nuclear and renewables, you know, about 20%. The bar on the right there are interesting. They show how we use industry, energy across different sectors of the economy. And the top one is transportation. Transportation uses about a third of the total energy that we use in the country. So they are roughly you know, equal, uh, equally split. But you see a lot of red there. 90% of the energy that we use to move around today is from petroleum. Right? In the other sector, you see a little bit more diversity, a lot of natural gas in industry. You see buildings, the third bar already split uh, roughly in half between electricity and fossil fuels. And then you see down there how we are producing electricity. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But transportation is really a boring sector when it comes to energy. It is petroleum and petroleum. Uh, and it has been like that for, for a very long time. But hopefully we have a plan on how we're going to change what the energy system looks like today. Uh, the uh, Biden administration has published now, three years ago, the long-term strategy of the United States. This is basically articulating how are we going to go from where we are today to a system that is sustainable in 2050. And you see there are different sectors are going to evolve in different ways. You know, The solutions that we imagine are going to be needed to decarbonize buildings and to decarbonize transportation and to decarbonize industry are different. Uh, today... I'll start zooming in a little bit, and we'll talk about the transportation sector. About a third of the energy use, but the largest stores of greenhouse gas emissions in the country today, because it's heavily reliant on petroleum. There is more diverse, diversity in other sectors, so their emissions are proportionately a little bit smaller. Transportation is very polluting. It's the dirtiest, it's really responsible for a lot of poor air quality. We see very disproportionate impact on certain disadvantaged communities that happen to live close to freight centers or highways and ports and, and areas of the country that, that have uh, worse air quality. It's the second largest housing expenditures. is a major driver of global petroleum demand. Again, tying back to the geopolitics, a lot of implications coming with that. And so we, we really feel strongly that it is a key sector for decarbonization, and we need to eliminate nearly all emissions that comes on transportation by 2050. I'll keep you on this team so like we have a plan. You know, the same way that we have the long-term strategy of the United States, we have a plan on how do we decarbonize the economy. The Department of Energy, the Department of Transportation and Environmental Protection Agency came together and uh, just over a year ago published this big blueprint that basically explains what do we think is the path to the decarbonized transportation system. And it fundamentally relies on three principles, three pillars. We need mobility to become more convenient. You know, it's really hard to decarbonize transportation when you have to drive, you know, 40, 50 miles a day, you know, each way. So, so almost 100 miles round trip when you live in a, in a community where uh, it's heavily car dependent and you don't have any other option to reach services and workplaces and schools. And so, so really increasing the convenience of mobility and rethinking the way that we have designed transportation system is a key pillar. The second big, biggest, uh, big pillar is efficiency. You know, if we can improve efficiency uh, at the system level, if we can shift travel to mode of transportation that are more efficient, for example, rail, for example, transit, for example, micro mobility and, and, and bikes and scooters, uh, that really helps to reduce emission. And perhaps not surprisingly, the, the third pillar is what we call here clean. Well, if instead of burning gasoline, we use clean fuels like electricity, like perhaps hydrogen, like perhaps sustainable uh, uh, biofuels, that will really help reduce transportation emissions. So all three of these pillars are going to have to play a big role for transportation to become sustainable by 2050. Uh, but, but I'll highlight that from a climate perspective, when it comes to reducing emissions, the third pillar, the clean, is really where we expect about 80 to 90 percent of the benefit to come from. You know, when you think about quality of life, when you think about time spent in traffic, you know, convenience is a lot more important. Uh, but when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it's really transitioning what we have today, which is mostly gasoline and diesel, to something that is clean. And electric vehicles are uh, are a great solution to do just that. I mean, I bet everyone here has been on an electric vehicle at this point. Has anyone not been on an electric vehicle? Okay, when I when I gave talk like this just five years ago, 
many people would raise their hand. The, the advance of electric vehicles has been impressive. Um, I'll tell you, you know, I've been working on clean energy for uh, maybe 15 years now. And the big thing in clean energy has been renewables for, for a very long time. That was the game changer. It's like, oh, now we have solar and wind and they are cost competitive. And we, and we are replacing fossil fuel uh, generating power plants with renewables. Uh, this chart is really interesting. This is from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And, and it shows that last year, over $600 billion were invested in renewables, a growth of 10% from the previous year. So, so really big number, right? Again, this is a game changer for the energy system. Well, guess what? Last year, electric vehicles investment were $632 billion. is $10 billion more than renewables. So you hear a lot about renewables. Last year, we invested more in electric vehicles than we did in renewables. So... You know, I, I wanted to show you this chart because sometimes you see those big plans from government and you have these strategies. And some of the comments I get is like, yeah, that's really good talking, but are we actually walking the talk? Are we doing this? We are. You know, $600 billion invested in an electric vehicle just last year, right? We, we really think this is going to be a game changer for transportation and for the power sector. And that's my next zoom in. Let's start uh, looking at that intersection a little bit. Um, electric vehicles are, are really a game changer for transportation. This picture is from a couple of years ago, but I really like the subtitle, so, so I'm, I'm not willing to change it to the 21 and 22 and 23 edition. Is entering the decade of electric drive. Okay, we, we are really transitioning from, you know, gasoline vehicles are the norm to electric vehicles are the norm. Uh, battery costs have declined. There is plenty of support. There is plenty of availability. Everyone now has been on an electric vehicle. Uh, so, so we really think that, that EVs are coming on uh, very rapidly. Every time that I update my talks about electric vehicle, I need to update our projections of how quickly EVs are coming online. So, so I keep being told that I'm too optimistic, and then I keep uh, shooting too, uh, uh, too low, and every time I have to update my projections. Uh, but, but last year... One in 10 vehicles sold in the US uh, was electric. Globally, we're still not leading. 14% uh, of vehicles globally was electric. There are countries like Norway, that where they are in 90% sales. There are countries like Europe and China, where they are you know, between 20 and 30%. <clears throat> California is around 30%, so, so I guess uh, you guys are doing quite well. Uh, some other states are still lagging a little bit behind. But it is impressive. One vehicle in 10 sold in the US was electric last year. And we are seeing this really skyrocketing. <clears throat> if, you, if you think about technology adoption and, and you have done some modeling work, you have heard about S-curve S and S-shapes. Uh, you, know, you start slow as the technology matures and it becomes really competitive and available. And then it just shoots up, right? The adoption skyrockets. We're right there at that inflection point. We're seeing it skyrocketing. Um, and I, I don't know how many I should have asked at the beginning how many of you are in a, in a transportation program, but, but if you have taken transportation classes, this is a very typical figure. Uh, so, so I wanted to share it with you guys. The, the figure on the left is New York City in, in 1900. Uh, and, and if you look at that, people are moving around with horses uh, most, most, uh, for the most part, and there is one car in there. And then you look at the figure on the, on the right, which is the same street in New York just 13 years later. And uh, I guess I should make a joke here. You should try and spot the horse. It's really hard. There is one horse in there, and everything else is a car. So that, 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 that gives you a good idea of how quickly things could change. Just 13 years, over a century ago, you know, where communication wasn't as widespread as, as it is today, it was a lot harder uh, to, to get to know new technologies and new solutions. But that's how long it took for the automobile to took over horses. Um, and there was a lot of pushback for automobiles. There was a lot of people that uh, made the same argument that I heard about about, uh, about gasoline vehicles today, right? How the, the, gas, the automobile wasn't going to be any better than horses ever. Same way that you might hear, oh, electric vehicles are going to be better than gasoline vehicles ever. It only took 13 years, right? So, so this is a good thing to keep in mind. Um, so I, I believe EVs will be coming very fast. Uh, and, and there are two key elements uh, that, that I wanted to touch on a little bit more today. One is charging infrastructure. Right? As we transition from one fuel to another, a key element is, well, I need infrastructure to be able to charge those vehicles. Uh, and, and one of the key points of, of electric vehicles is that you can charge them in a way that is a lot more convenient than what you do today with gasoline vehicles. On average, a vehicle is parked for 95% of the time. 
And that is all downtime that you can use to recharge your electric vehicle. You can't use it to refuel your gasoline vehicle because you need to go to a gasoline station to do that. We have electricity everywhere. Like it's a great advantage. And so, so one of the, we, we do a lot of work on assessing electric vehicle charging infrastructure. That was probably baked somewhere in the, in the very long bio. Uh, but if you are interested in this, uh, come check out some of our results. I'm not going to go too much into in, in detail, uh, but one of the, the key messages is that you shouldn't think about charging infrastructure for electric vehicle as a replacement for gasoline stations. We're not trying to replace gasoline stations with charging stations that do what gasoline stations do. We're trying to do something better, where you charge while you're sleeping, where you charge while you're working, where you charge while you're watching a movie or grocery shopping, and it li li literally takes no time. That's the that's the key element. You know, it's not how long do I need to wait at the gasoline station. Is you shouldn't be waiting at all. The vehicle should just be charged while you do something else. Um, so there is a lot of slogans like uh, slow slow charging is convenient charging. You know, but but really think about charging as a whole different new paradigm, and it's not an alternative to go into a gasoline station. It's something different. And then there are implications for the energy system. You know, you, you saw earlier those big red charts, right? If all that, that petroleum becomes electricity, well, of course, that's going to have major implications for, for the power system. EVs are expected to be the largest source of growth in electricity demand. I have a couple of slides uh, that, that, talk, uh, that talk a little bit more about this. And not just that, the power grid is really transforming, right? Renewables are the game changer, right? They've been the big deal. And so we are going from a system that uses fossil fuels to produce electricity to a system that uses renewables to produce electricity. And this new system is going to be less flexible. And EVs bring in that flexibility back into the system. And again, I have a couple of slides to go, to go in detail into this, but, but it's a really big topic. Overall, the key message that, that, that I like to leave you with, uh, you, you, you probably have read a lot of uh, news titles that electric vehicles are breaking the grid. They're going to cause a lot of brownout and disruptions and whatnot. What our research is showing is that if we integrate electric vehicles in a smart way, they strengthen the grid, they, they reduce cost, and they increase resiliency. So it's exactly the opposite. If these are not a bad news for the grid, they are great news for the grid. So, so I just want to uh, sort of contextualize things. Um, I'll skip this couple of slides, but if you're interested in charging infrastructure, it's a very fascinating topic, very interesting. We have done a lot of work in this space, um, and so, so there are a lot of reports that you can, you can check out. But let's talk about vehicle grid integration. So I've told you electric vehicles are going to be the biggest source of electricity demand or load growth. This is a study we did now, now almost five years ago, and it's called Electrification Future Study. And we basically looked at what the economy would look like if all sectors were to electrify, you know, we use more electricity in buildings, we, we use more electricity in industry, and we use more electricity in transportation. But what we found is that transportation is really expected to drive this growth in electricity demand. Because in the other sectors, first of all, you already have large use of electricity uh, today, and you can offset some of the growth with efficiency gains, right? So you electrify your buildings. Now you use an electric stove instead of a natural gas stove. But you also make your windows better. So you use less energy in general for air conditioning and for heating. And so those two things sort of work one against each other and, and sort of wash it, uh, the growth in electricity out of it. Um, transportation is not like that. You go from gasoline to electricity. So of course, your demand for electricity is going to go a lot. That's the electricity demand in the US for the last 70 years. The scene has been roughly split in three. Residential building, commercial building, industry, roughly a third each. They have all grown very much until about 20 years ago. And then, then loads have been pretty stable for, for the past 20 years. And transportation is invisible. It's about 0.2% uh, of electricity demand today. Uh, this was a few years ago. Now it's 0.3%, very, very small still. Right? We think that by 2050, that 0.2, 0.3% is going to grow to about 25%. So two orders of money to growth in the importance of, of uh, transportation for the power system. You see that all of the future projections there, blue is where the growth comes from. Blue is transportation, which is what you don't see in the past. Um, and we have done a lot of studies to look at this from different perspectives. 
Um, if this is a topic that you're interested in, uh, we, we just published this, this paper in Nature that looks at what does it take to decarbonize transportation. And we really see, you know, electric vehicles are, are a key element. You, you don't get to a clean transportation system unless you convert to electric vehicles. You need to do other things as well, but unless you do that, you, you won't get there. Uh, and we try to estimate how much electricity is it going to take to get to a fully decarbonized transportation system. So similar to the figure that you saw before, this is a little bit more nuanced and, and is a lot, a lot of uh, different scenarios. There is a lot of uncertainty, you know. Are people going to buy large SUVs or going to uh, buy compact cars? How much is population going to grow? How much are we going to travel? Um, you know, there are a lot of variables that, that are, uh, that are uh, subject to, to significant uncertainty. Uh, and so we looked at, you know, how much electricity could we possibly need to power transportation? And we came up with, this, with these numbers that are pretty mind-blowing. So, so today, we consume about 4,000 terawatt hours for the entire economy. That's the, our total electricity demand. In 2050, we might need up to 3,000 just for transportation. That's a huge number. Again, 2050 is only 25 years away. You're talking about almost doubling the size of the power system. That's a bit of an extreme. That's everyone drives a ton, everyone buys SUVs. They're very inefficient. We don't invest in energy efficiency. So maybe it's a little bit of a worst case scenario, unlikely to, to materialize. But we see that on average, you know, around 1,500 terawatt hours is what we're gonna need to power transportation. So still, 4,000 plus, you know, 1,500 is a big number. It's gonna be a big, big growth in electricity demand. You probably already know this, I'm still gonna say it uh, anyway, but, but how does our power system work? Well, the fundamental principle is that the demand for electricity and the supply for electricity must match at every instant. Right? That means that if you turn on the light, somewhere in the power system, there is a power plant that's generating a little bit more electricity to power your light bulb. You know, that keeping that balance is the key element of the power system. And up until today, the way that that has worked is that we consume electricity whenever we want and whenever we need it. And the supply side adapts. You know, you turn on the light, there is a gas turbine somewhere that starts spinning a little bit faster and generates a little bit more electricity to keep that balance. Well, the power grid is changing. We're not gonna have gas turbines. We're not gonna have coal fired power plants that you can you know, sort of modulate or dispatch uh, is, is the technical term that, that's used in power system. We're gonna have solar and wind plants and you can tell the sun that it needs to shine a little bit more right now because I want to turn the power on or the wind that it needs to blow a little bit more. And so you are losing flexibility on the supply side of the power system. You can't regulate how much electricity you produce anymore. You get what you get. And so it becomes incredibly important to add that flexibility back on the demand side. Again, demand and supply needs to match. We can't control supply. Can we control demand? That's the old concept of electric vehicle manager. Again, electric vehicles are parked for 95% of the time. Usually you get back home, you plug in your vehicle, and you have 10 or 12 hours to charge for those 30, 40, 50 miles that you, that you drove that day. And that only takes an hour or two. So really the vehicle is sitting there doing nothing for most of the time, and you can easily decide when you want to do that charging without impacting the ability of the vehicle to drive you where you need to be, when you need to be. And so we have done a ton of work uh, on managed charging. Like we see a terrific value there for power system. We see value for transportation systems. And we've done a lot of studies to, to really try and understand how can we leverage this resource and how valuable it is? So the first step is really understanding when and where do we need, do we need electricity. I've told you a lot of numbers about how much electricity we need. That's important, right? What is the size of the pie? Well, when we were talking about petroleum and gasoline, that was the whole story, right? How much petroleum do we need? It doesn't matter if you use it at noon on a Saturday or at midnight on a Friday. It's the same thing, you know, refineries work the same way. We can put it in big tanks and store it. It's not that big of a deal. For electricity, it's a huge deal. You consume electricity uh, at 5 p.m. on a Friday. Again, supply and demand must match. We need to our supply to, put, to give you that power. If you consume it on a Wednesday night at 2 a.m., it's a lot easier because no one else is consuming electricity, right? So, so the first step was really tie and go from 
this is how much electricity we need to where and when do we need that electricity. Uh, so that there was a lot of modeling that happened in the, in the transportation community over the last decade to really start thinking along those lines. You know, it's, it's a big, for, for modelers and analysts, it's a big game changer, right? It's not just how much, but where and when. So I, I need to think about time. I need to think about space. It's complicated. Um, we have developed new models. This was, this was a big push for the last decade when it comes to transportation research. Um, I'll give you an example here, but there are many, many other examples. Some of your professors here have published a lot of great work in this space, uh, but we published this last year. Uh, this is um, county level. Uh, you see here aggregated at the state level, but the underlying data is at the county level. Uh, for at the hourly level, how much electricity are we going to need uh, to charge electric vehicles? It's a great data set. I, I wanted to put this slide in here because if you are doing work and research in this space, you can just go grab this data and use it for your purposes. Uh, most of the work that we produce is publicly available, so it's on our, on our website. And if you have trouble accessing it, you can email us. We're always happy to support uh, people, especially students, uh, using our data and our resources. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a, an idea of what this looks like. You know, when you look at different areas of the countries, uh, people tend to drive more or less depending on where they live. You know, if you live in New York City, you drive a lot less than if you live in, in rural Montana, right? Uh, you drive different kinds of cars, pickup trucks versus compact or mid-sized cars have very different energy needs. The weather changes during the year, which impacts electric vehicle consumption in major ways, you know, plus or minus 50% between peak summer and, and shoulder season. So, so it's a big deal. So we really uh, took a, a deep dive here to understand how these EV charging loads were going to change in space and in time over the next uh, few decades. And you see some of those curves there, you know, 0 0.9 or, or, or 0 0.3, those are normalized. The, the, the absolute number doesn't matter all that much. But, you know, it's a 3x difference in, in electricity demand. So it's a big deal. When you think about integrating EVs with the grid, really keep in mind where you are and when you're thinking about matters a lot. The next step, once you, uh, the next step, you know, you know how much electricity you need, you know where and when you need it. And then you start thinking, well, so EVs are really flexible, right? I can charge them different ways. I can I can leverage that flexibility. But well, how valuable is that flexibility? And how should I charge EVs? So we 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 do we did this study maybe maybe three years ago now. And we, we really look at the entire spectrum of the power system and we and we asked ourselves, what could EVs do for the power system? And we came up with a lot of different answers. You know, you could reduce the amount of generating capacity that you need. Like if you can shift the load around, instead of needing you know, X gigawatt and you need to build that many power plants to produce it, you might be able to, to, uh, to need less power plants. So you need to build less, less transmission lines, less power plants, and all the implications associated with that. You can also increase resilience to ex extreme events. Heat wave hits California and everyone turns on their air conditioners. Can you push back EV charging by a couple of days and drop 25, 30% of your load? Yes, you can. And that's extremely valuable. You don't have brownouts. You don't need to turn off air conditioners. And you can still get to charge your vehicles the next day. And it doesn't impact you in any way. Uh, you can support commitment and dispatch decision if this is something that, that you're looking at in terms of power systems. You, know, you, you can better operate the power plants that you have. So not only you need to build less, but the ones that you build, you can operate in a more efficient way. You can improve power quality, power quality, voltage regulation, frequency regulation, make sure that the power system works in a better way. Uh, and in general, do that instead of deploying devices that do that uh, specifically, which lowers your cost. So instead of spending you know, $200 a month in your electricity bill, maybe now you spend 180 or 190 because your EVs are doing some of the services that otherwise would have taken more devices. And of course you can support other Consumers, uh, you've seen this a lot in recent commercials, for example, the F-150 lighting, like you go somewhere and you power what you need to power with your vehicle. And so th think of a scenario where all of a sudden there is a brownout and all of your food in your freezer is going bad and you can just power your freezer with your vehicle. Or you can keep your, your modem working and you can take a very interesting class from Stanford University instead of being in the dark. Right? So there is a lot of value there. Over the next couple of slides here, and then and then I'll wrap up. 
I'll show you a couple of case studies. So, so there has been probably thousands, for sure several hundreds of studies to understand what is the value of electric vehicles in some of these columns. Different researchers, again, including some of your professors, Ram has done a lot of work in this space, uh, really looking at what can electric vehicles do for this, what can electric vehicles do for that. I just want to flag this, that we're still waiting for the study that rules them all, that understands what could vehicles do for the entire power system? What are the trade-offs between supporting capacity expansion requirement versus uh, dispatch uh, decisions or improving resiliency? Uh, as far as I know, that study doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, so if you're doing research, that's probably a very, very exciting area for research. We, we, we have a few projects in this space, but it's a very complicated question that we haven't answered yet. I'll, I'll probably skip this slide and, and show you those, those case studies, right? So how valuable is uh, managed charging for different parts of the power system? Going back to the study that I mentioned earlier, the electrification future study was a big study. We electrified the whole economy. We see what happens. Well, we saw that most of the electricity demand growth came from electric vehicles. And most of the flexibility that you can add to the system came to, from electric vehicles. So we use some of our detailed model uh, you might have heard of the REITS model. It's an open source model of the power system that you can download and play with. And basically, try to project what does the power system looks like 20, 30 years from now under different scenarios. You know, how much solar are we going to have, how much wind, and how are things going to evolve? And we saw that by introducing electric vehicles and exploiting this flexibility in how you charge electric vehicles, we reduce the, the expansion the capacity expansion requirements by about 10%. So, so you need to build about 10% less power plants just by exploiting uh, electric vehicles. And, and, and this is huge. Like when it comes to power systems, you know, you hear studies saying like, oh, we could save 1% capacity and it's a big deal, right? 1% of a huge system is a big deal. This is 10%, right? Like this number is incredibly large. So $84 billion in savings is, is, is really big number, right? So, so a lot of value in terms of not needing to expand the system quite as much. And the other comment I'll make, is not just cost, but it's also feasibility. Can we build enough transmission lines? Can we deploy solar and wind fast enough to achieve our objectives? A lot of the time, the answer is like, well, it's going to be really hard. Right? I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's going to be really hard. And so reducing how much we need is going to be really helpful, right? Not only it costs us less, but maybe we can actually do it uh, instead, instead of being stuck in a, in a system where, yeah, we would like to do it, but we don't have enough capacity due to workforce, due to permitting, due to a million other reasons to transform the power system. So that's what the power system looks like, capacity expansion, how many power plants do we need to build, how many transmission lines do, do I need to build? Well, the other, the other angle that TVs can support is like, well, given a system, like the system is what it is, but now I have electric vehicles, can I operate the system in a better way? So this is a different study that we did just last year, and we use a different model that, that doesn't project what the power system looks like, but projects how you're going to operate the power system. So you have those power plants, how do you use them? How do you make the system work? And we saw that EVs with uh, leveraging, Manage charging, right? If you if you have EV EV charging in a in a dumb way, well, nothing happens. But if you start introducing manage charging and you do smart choices, you reduce cost, you reduce emissions, you reduce uh, peak load requirements, and you reduce charging costs for vehicles, which again is a self reinforcing cycle. But now I pay less for electricity; it costs me less to charge. Electric vehicles are even a better proposition than they were before. So we sort of reinforce the cycle, and then you have even more vehicles, and you can add even more value and save even more money. Uh, so, so very interesting study there. Uh, I'll also flag, I don't know how many of you are, are looking into uh, power markets, uh, but, but one interesting finding that, that, we, that we got is, is sort of the size of those markets and the diminishing value that you get as you have more and more vehicles participating into those programs, which is kind of expected, right? You know, there is a service that you can provide with EVs. And if there are only a few vehicles of, uh, providing that service, they get a lot of revenue out of it. Now, as you start increasing the number of people that participate into those markets and provide those services, the marginal value per, per vehicle that you add diminishes, right? And so, so there are some interesting dynamics there uh, that haven't really been resolved on how do we make sure 
the attracting vehicle owners get enough compensation for these programs to engage, right? If you're saving $10 a month, yeah, you're probably not willing to do anything for that, right? It's not even worth your time to look into how that works. If you get tens or hundreds of dollars, you know, things change, right? So, so there are a lot of interesting uh, discussions uh, going on on electricity market design and how something like this is going to impact uh, those designs. And then the last case study I want to show you, and I should have said this uh, when I showed you the, the, the power system chart. You know, power system has generation, it has transmissions, and it has distribution. Those are the three big pieces of the power system. Uh, generation is about 60% of cost today. You know, when you pay electricity, about 60% of what you pay is for generating electricity. About 10% is for transmitting electricity. Those are, you know, over long distances, big transmission lines, and about 30% is for distribution networks. Those are the transformers that you see, you know, behind your houses that you connect to, right? At the very last mile, if you will, of the, of the system. By the way, we expect distribution cost to become a bigger proportion of system cost in the future because of distributed energy resources and, and a lot of other things. Uh, but, but this is a very uh, contentious point uh, with, with electric vehicles integration. You know, they're gonna stress distribution system more, right? Because they're big loads. You know, you think about what you have at home. You know, you use your refrigerator and your stove and your microwave, and then all of a sudden you attach an electric vehicle that might be, you know, seven kilowatt of load. It, it's a big, it's a big deal. Not even thinking about big trucks, uh, which is the the point of this study. Uh, we we looked at what happens when we connect class eight. Semi trucks. Those are the 18 wheelers. You know the big Tesla semi truck. You see those on, on the highway. Big beasts. Uh, and and what happens to the distribution network when you charge? When you start charging those those vehicles? Well, we found a couple of very interesting things. One, uh, which I myself did not expect, and I'm supposedly a transportation expert, uh, but about 70 percent of those big trucks only really drive less than 100 miles a day. And so when you think about charging them. It doesn't have to be, again, megawatt level, extreme, fast charging. You get in and in 10 minutes you need to get out. You know, some trucks are going to need that. They drive Los Angeles to New York nonstop. They have two drivers. They want to be on the road as much as possible. But 70% of them do not. Right? So we found uh, electricity demand uh, for charging uh, numbers much lower than we were expecting. In, in this study, we see between 10 and 74 kilowatts. So, so if, you, if you're not overly familiar with, it, with, with that, 10 is what a light duty vehicle does. You know, if you plug in your, your Tesla or, or your, uh, your whichever, whichever EV you have, hopefully you have an EV. Um, but, but that's roughly the power level that you're talking about. But now you're charging this huge semi-truck, right? So, so much lower power levels than we were expecting. And we found, we did this study in Texas with a with large utility. Uh, they, they serve about 8 million customers in Texas. And, and we found that about 80% of the substations that they operate today could accommodate uh, 100 uh, of these semi-trucks without any change to the system. So, so it's, it's interesting, and it's brought a little bit of discussion because the, the general thinking is, well, as soon as you buy one of those trucks, you need to replace the entire grid, right? It's going to just destroy everything, and you need everything new. Uh, well, it depends, right? We saw that in many cases that, that that's not going to happen. Uh, but I also want to highlight how distribution networks are very heterogeneous, right? So, so uh, what happens in a study that you do in an area in Texas is going to be very different than what happens in a study that you do in another area. And so, so if you're looking for interesting areas for research, this is another good topic of like, how do we do a study that sort of represents what happens in general? There, there are millions of distribution networks in the country, like millions. Um, keep in mind, we have about 110 million households. And this, this system usually covers five to 10 houses, right? So, so uh, tens of millions of distribution networks. So a lot of variability. It's still not really clear how we're gonna do a study that, that models all of them. But what, we, what we've seen is that in some cases, it's not as bad as, as some might think. In other cases, it, it, it will be. Um, so this was the last case study I wanted to show you. Just to give you an idea, you know, depending on where we look at uh, in the power system and what vehicles can do, we get a lot of interesting results and again, you know, the trade-offs between those different solutions is something that is still a little bit unexplored. Uh, but, but I'll leave you with a, with a couple of points, this, and this is my last slide. Um, what we see is that on the horizon, there is a future where we're going to have abundant and cheap clean electricity. 
And that's going to open up this unique opportunity to clean up the transportation sector. It's going to be a lot of electric vehicles. And there might be some production of energy-dense, low-carbon fuels, hydrogen e-fuels, and other solutions that might be needed, for example, to decarbonize aviation, to decarbonize uh, international shipping, and, and, and things like that. But really, you know, the cleaning up of the grid is, is giving us finally an opportunity to clean up transportation. And this is a win-win situation because by introducing EVs, we can make it easier to decarbonize the grid because we add that flexibility back into the system, right? And so, and this is the beauty of this managed charging is that you, one needs the other to be successful. There is like this symbiotic relationship between renewables and EVs that's very fascinating. And it's, it's a great use for the planet, right? Because now we get to decarbonize the two uh, biggest emitters of emissions in, in the economy. Uh, so we are doing a lot of work in this space. A lot of other uh, organizations, including Stanford, are doing a lot of work in this space. Uh, but if this is the topic that you guys feel passionate about and you're interested in, again, a lot of our data and tools are available on our website. We are constantly looking for interns, postdocs, researchers, and people to work in this area. So, so if, if you're interested, reach out to us. We would love to collaborate with you guys. We would love to have you come and help us solve some of these big challenges. Um, and with that, I have a long slide of references. So if you're interested in, you know, oh, that sounded interesting. I want to I wanna know more. You know, I can probably talk about any of this topic for 15 hours, but it's, it's, it's perhaps more effective to go and read some of the studies. You have my contact. Uh, maybe, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, and maybe we can have a little bit of a Q&A and debate. Yeah, go ahead. So, so the, the fundamental answer is a little bit of all of the above, right? Today, what we see is mostly price varying, um, time varying pricing, right? So, you know, your price of electricity changes, uh, I don't know, in Denver where I live at 7 p.m., price of electricity drops from 24 cents to 6 cents. And so, and so people naturally sort of program their EVs to start charging at that point in time, right? And you can think about more sophisticated way of doing that, where instead of always being fixed at 7 p.m., you get the signal, your meter, uh, and, and you can do that in a little bit more uh, more dynamic way between the consumers and the utility. But we think that varying price is going to be a, a key mechanism to implement managed charging. Uh, I am a big fan of programs that are not necessarily designed that way. Uh, and, and those are already largely used. Again, my, my own personal example, where we live in Colorado, I get $40 a year, and the utility can turn off my air conditioner three times a year. And I don't even know this. I don't even know if they've ever done it, right? Because they turn off my air conditioner for 10, 15 minutes, even if it's running. I, I, I have no idea. I literally never notice if, if they've ever done it. And they make 40 bucks a year uh, without fundamentally doing anything. That could be another mechanism uh, to, uh, to leverage EV flexibility, right? You can stop your charging at some point, and it doesn't really impact you. Uh, but you mentioned another really good point. We also see good value for what we call aggregators, right? And so, so that's a third party in between utilities and consumers, and and they sort of interface with both, right? And they they sell services to to utilities. So that that value of that flexibility is something that they they put into the market and they bid on and they and they sell to utilities, and then they find ways to engage consumers. Which could be either a fixed, uh, uh, you know, premium per month. It could be it could be variable pricing and whatnot. Uh, the, the reason why I told you like it's a little bit of uh, all of the above is that we are still experimenting. Uh, we are in the U.S. and all over the world, people are, um, and and we see really good responses. We see really good uh, outcomes from multiple programs. I I don't think we're gonna converge into a single way of doing it. I think it's gonna be a lot of different solutions, uh, and they're all gonna play a role. So you spend money to want to do that, is just to get the type of signal or the real-time signal? Yeah, really good point. So V2G, vehicle to grid. Not only you are choosing when you charge your vehicle, but you provide power back. Uh, and, and I'll caveat, there are two ways that this is useful. One is what I was mentioning, you power our other loads, and that has a value, or you just inject it back into the grid. And so effectively now your vehicles are a storage device, right? The grid puts electricity in, in, in EVs at some point and takes it back when it needs it. It is valuable. We, we, all of our studies, all the studies that, that I've seen show that clearly if you can do that, it adds value 
on top of just scheduling when you can charge EVs. Um, what we're seeing is that the, the value is there, but it's not, it's not significantly larger than just scheduling vehicle charging, right? So, and scheduling vehicle charging is a lot simpler uh, because it doesn't really impact uh, consumers from a mobility perspective, right? If, if I get back home and I, and I need to charge over 10 hours and you tell me like, oh, you can charge in the first two hours and in, in the last two hours, I fundamentally don't care. If you're telling me you might discharge your vehicle, you, we get a lot of uh, sort of survey results with anxiety saying like, what if an emergency happens and I need to drive and now my EV is discharged and whatnot. Like keep in mind, people buy vehicles to move around. That's the main goal, right? Not, not to support the grid. Uh, so, so this to say, we, we see value in there. I think it's gonna happen a little bit later. I think people are gonna get used to manage charging and get comfortable with EVs. Those are two big concepts that are different from today. And V2G is gonna come as a sort of a, as a third step down the line. And, and, and where we see most of the value is not so much in reducing costs or reducing maybe great requirements, but it's in emergency situations, like resiliency and, and situation level, which is really important, right? And so what if by discharging your vehicle, you can prevent a, a brownout for your entire neighborhood for the next 12 hours or something, right? That is a lot of value. Uh, so, so we see we see really the resiliency angle be the the winning angle for for V two G. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so, and, and let me maybe clarify: we are going to need to upgrade the grid, right? It's not it, we're going to consume a lot more electricity. The system needs to be bigger, uh, but, which is not a bad news, right? You know, when you when you are a utility and your business is selling power, someone is telling you, well. You, can you sell 20 or 30% more power? Well, you know, usually businesses are happy about that, right? So, so the system needs to expand, uh, but, but it's not, at least in my view, as dramatic as like, oh, you adopt three EVs and you need to replace the whole grid, right? It's going to be gradual, it's going to take time. Uh, we think that hydrogen could have a big role in, uh, in decarbonizing heavy duty transportation, not for passenger vehicles, probably not for buses, but, but when it comes to big trucks, especially the ones that drive long distances, they might require very high uh, charging levels otherwise that are a lot more impactful on the grid. You know, uh, we, we think the hydrogen could play a big role there. Two things to keep in mind is a technology that is one step behind electric vehicles, right? As I was saying, you know, we're selling millions of electric vehicles. They are cost competitive. They are a commercial technology. We're selling tens of hydrogen vehicles, right? So, so it's sort of one step behind. So the technology needs to still improve, it needs to be proven, uh, and we're not, we're not quite there yet. Um, and hopefully we will. We have you know, billions of dollars invested at the federal government level to get there, but, but, but I think there is still a big difference between we are deploying EVs as fast as we can, we are still trying to develop the technology for, for hydrogen fuel cells to, to get to that point. And there is also another interesting thing to keep in mind that at the local level, Yes, you have a hydrogen station. <clears throat> Instead of adding a big electric load, you refuel your hydrogen truck. And that's a lot less stress on the system. <clears throat> Sorry. But if you produce hydrogen from electricity, you still need about twice as much electricity overall than to power EVs. So it might be in a better location. It might, it might be a better time of the day. <clears throat> so it might, it might not require distribution upgrades. But you still need to expand the power system twice as much. Because overall, you need twice as much electricity. That, that, that's roughly the math. So, so keep that in mind. Every time you think about hydrogen, if it's made from electricity, you need about twice as much electricity than a comparable electric. I don't know if there are questions online, just, just unmute yourself and, and participate. Um, so in the pg and &E territory, Generation is about 10 cents a kilowatt hours and transmission and distribution plus other is suddenly about 30 cents a kilowatt hours. Will increase electric vehicles across the same asset uh, degrees, I guess, decrease rates like the math suggests? Well, it's, it's complicated, right? E, yeah, I like to look a little bit more into this. Uh, overall, again, uh, when it comes to distribution systems, it, it gets very complicated very quickly because they're all so different, right? And so, so it's really hard to generalize and say, well, this is gonna happen. There is always going to be 
an example or, or one case where the opposite happens, right? And, and it's really hard to do statistics because, again, with millions of these, it, it's hard to model them all and it's hard to even keep track of what happens. Even utilities have much lower mon monitoring level of distribution system than, than one might, might perhaps expect. Um, and so, so it, get, it gets complicated quickly. I think it's, it's important to look at the, you know, sort of statistics, say like, well, okay, in this one case, cost might double, but in nine other cases, cost drop by 10%. So when you, when you average things out, at the end, you have a, you know, 8% cost savings or whatever it is, right? So, so keep that in mind. Drilling down when it comes to this system is really hard. Uh, and, and utilities are well used to this, right? If you build a house in a remote area, well, they, they need to serve that load. So they're building a whole distribution network that's maybe two miles long and might cost a million dollars to serve one house. And that cost gets spread over, over everyone. Uh, and in general, some houses are cheaper to serve and some houses are more expensive. And, and one of the principles has been that like, we spread the, those costs among all consumers. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be like, well, you live a little bit farther away and so you should spend $3,000 a month in your electric bill. Um, and so, so here is a little bit of the same principle the system is going to be more efficient. This is going to benefit everyone. And, and in general, some, you know, if you are a heavy driver and you drive a lot, it might benefit you a little bit more. If you don't have a car, it's not going to benefit uh, you. But, you know, it's a little bit of uh, the rule of the average. Does that answer your question? And, and yes, we can pause the slides. Uh, sorry that you guys couldn't see. I was pointing at a lot of graphs, so it's probably it was probably a little boring uh, to hear. But uh, we'll pause the slides. Or at least you, you, you feel free to send out the slides. Uh, I have a question about also the budget with public transmission and generation level. Uh, we're going to use the collection of the different types of the generation level might be more related to the time that the renewables generate, and then it's just the capacity at both level and also Yeah, it's it's a really good point. Uh, you know, and, and and that's what I was referring to when I say like the trade-offs between what EVs can do isn't really fully understood. And those needs are actually often uh, very conflicting, right? Today, the pricing is usually, you're right, based on generation. And you say like, oh, we have a lot of solar in the middle of the day. Can you charge your EV, right? And you get an incentive because price is low. Or if you are in an area with a lot of wind, can you charge in the middle of the night because we have a lot of wind and no one wants to consume power? On the distribution side, you would want the opposite, right? Well, it's the middle of the day. Yeah, you have a lot of solar, but there are other loads. It's hot. My transformer is already hot. You add more load, now you're overloading my transport, right? And so you're benefiting on the bulk power side, but you're losing on the distribution side, or you could do the opposite. And, and I don't have a good answer for you. We, we have a project that just started a couple of weeks ago to look at those trade-offs. But as far as I know, no one has looked into that, right? You know, people look at like, oh, what can you do for distribution? What can you do for generation? And the trade-off between the two, you know, there is a global optimum somewhere in there, but we don't know where it is. Um, and also keep in mind that in today's system, generation overwhelms the cost compared, not maybe overwhelms, but it's significantly higher than distribution. And so, so the reasoning is like, well, if you can save a lot on generation, sure, maybe you spend a little bit more in distribution, but those costs are lower anyway, and so, so maybe it doesn't matter. As the system evolves and the two get closer, because generation gets cheaper and distribution gets more expensive, those trade-offs are going to become even more, even more important. So, so you have a great idea in there. I don't have a good answer, but but it's a really, really fascinating topic. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't touch on on any of that. Um, but the actual flag shape, if you will, you know, whether you use one or the other, doesn't really matter all that all that much. But consistent communication and control protocols are absolutely critical for any of these to work, right? If you want utilities and grid operators and distribution system operators and electric vehicle owners and fleets to all work together, they need to be using the same standards. They need to be able to communicate with one another. 
uh, and, and so there is a huge push on the standardization of all of these protocols and systems. Uh, it is it is a hard requirement in my in my mind. Like if we if we don't get there, yeah, the the shape could be different. It doesn't really matter. But if you can communicate to one another, this is never going to work, right? And and communication becomes more and more important as you push to more sophisticated systems, right? If you just tell me like, well, at 7 p.m., your price of electricity is going to drop, and it's like that every single day. You can just easily program it in your car. No big deal. If you start saying, well, the price is dynamic, and today is 7 p.m., tomorrow might be 8 p.m., the day after might be midnight, you, know, you still, still start to, to need a bit more communication. And, and the end goal to me is to have two-way communications where, where vehicles not only can inject power back into the grid, but can, they can inform the grid of how much flexibility is available. Right, we we have that in our parking garage, Tenral. Where, where when I go in and plug in my vehicle, he asks me at what time I'm leaving and how much am I going to have to drive when I leave. So with those two pieces of information, he decides how much charging I get and when, so that I can do the driving that I need to do and and I can I can have the vehicle charged when I need to leave. Right, but that requires that the vehicle, in this case the charging station, communicates back with the supply side, and the only way that I can see doing that at large scale is if we consistently use the same protocols. Otherwise, you know, the system is just not going to work. We already have enough reliability issues with, with charging. We, we, I don't think we need multiple uh, protocols and systems. So, so the, it's really important. Not, not something that I work personally a lot on and that didn't tech talk a, a lot about, uh, at all about it. Uh, but, but I think it's a hard prerequisite for this to work. 